capturing wild yeast. Yeah, and so you, uh, first of all, you want to capture wild yeast that actually tastes good, and there is a multitude of different things you can do with this. And so you can capture wild yeast as a starter, knowing that you're going to have multiple yeasts and bacteria, and you can kind of take that and run with it in a beer, or you can try to get more of an isolated culture, or at least you know narrow down what you're getting in your uh, in your capture and use that to try to grow up something that's special to you. Yeah, and I can tell you right now for those naysayers out there, uh, this is actually very, very much possible. In fact, we had a local home brewing club a couple years ago now um, actually do this experiment and out of, I believe, a dozen, 15 samples. I'd say like 14, yeah. Um, they actually ended up with about four or five that ended up being very, very much drinkable beers. Yeah, and so, uh, but the first thing, and we did kind of just touched on that a little bit, but the first thing to know when capturing wild yeast, uh, whether you're trying to get a mixed culture pitch or a pure pitch, uh, is it is a numbers game. Uh, even when you isolate relatively, you know, yeast like yeast uh, that fully attenuate so that's still a numbers game to just get yeast that are going to fully eat all your beer because a lot of yeasts are finicky uh, and they don't like to eat complex sugars like we have in malt um, but even if you do get a yeast that will fully attenuate beer out of those still maybe 10 to 20 percent will taste actually good so it is a numbers game and you got to realize that you're trying to uh, you know it's going to take multiple tries but fortunately you can do it in a very very small scale um, when you're growing these up so you can get through a lot of the uh, the slack of uh, of getting yeast relatively simply. And there's a couple ways to select for the yeast that you want at the very beginning that'll make it so that you can have an easier time getting yeast that are going to taste good. Yeah. So if you want to get um, a <clears throat> yeast culture that's you know going to actually ferment your beer out for you for one and taste good for another uh, point, uh, it really helps to start with what's called a selective media. And selective media is basically something that's going to get out all the bacteria, first of all, um, all the things that are going to potentially make you sick, uh, and uh, also select for things. Also, there are ways to select for things that are going to attenuate your beer. Um, but first, let's talk about the general uh, the general method because you're you're going to be doing this in two different ways. One is going to be you put your media out into areas of high yeast traffic, and generally these are going to be right around uh, areas of blooming plants, especially fresh fruits so like yeah. apples and grapes. Right now, uh, even hops too. Hops, uh, yeah. For those of you <laughs> harvesting hops, um, fall is actually a very good time for it too. So you're going to put your media out there. Um, you want to usually get out in nature. Generally, it's not recommended. Uh, don't go throw it in your bathroom. Yeah. Uh, don't. don't uh, or yeah, even your garden. If you got a dog back there. Yeah. Nah. Yeah. It's like it's one of those things. The um, more wild, the better. But if you can find yeah, like a exactly. wild apple tree, like even crab yep. apples, like whatever, that'd be a good place to put a growth media under. Yeah. Um, so you could do that with uh, wort. And going back to what makes wort selective is when you're putting things out there to grow, especially if you're growing wild yeast and bacteria, you want to make sure that you are pre-acidifying your uh, wort to under about four point five pH, which you can do either by calculating um, and then adding lactic acid or better yet, if you have a pH meter, you can actually test. Yep. So this is going to kill off a lot of those um, nasty microbes, um, <clears throat> a lot of the molds that are going to um, get in there and kind of just make you sick. Um, so you definitely want to avoid those as much as possible. Um, so on top of acidity, um, the next thing we're going to do is if we want to select specifically for yeast and we don't want to get um, any kind of, of our like lactose Lactobacillus lactose. or pediococcus. Yeah, yeah, lactose strains, any of those bacteria strains. Um, it's very easy to add a few hot pellets um, to that, that wort or that media is what we're going to be calling it for the, um, today. And uh, that's also going to select for those yeast um, because they are going to kill off any of those natural bacteria. And so that's kind of what we're going to focus on today is starting with at least knowing that we have probably a yeast culture. And uh, uh, so there's, we talked about putting your, uh, your growth media out into nature under, let's say, an apple tree, for yeah. example. Uh, you want that hopped, pre-pHed, or pre-acidified wort, basically, with yeast nutrients to be under the tree in a relatively yeah. open, like let's say, a wide mouth mason jar. And you want to put a couple layers of cheesecloth over it to make sure that you're not getting other things falling in. Yeah. I mean, with that said, you can do scrapings as well. Yeah. I know there's strains that live on tree bark a lot of them are specific to even like certain tree species yep. um, but you will get quite a bit of other things in there i definitely recommend if you're going to do that 
um, a very short term exposure yeah. is the way to go. Where, and then pull it back out. And then... Yeah, where if you have a jar, um, leaving it out overnight um, is going to be the best way to capture some, some yeast. Um, all that's going to be tem depend on the day and really how much stuff is floating around in the air. Yeah, and another way to do it is you can also, if you have fruit, like let's say an apple, uh, fresh apple that's off the tree, you can actually macerate that and let it ferment by itself for about 12 hours and then put some of that into your yeast starter too. So that's another way to use uh, whatever fruit or you know wildflower or even honey honestly like wild honey will have a lot of yeast just naturally on it uh, you can use that yeah. as an inoculant as well if you want to select against uh, some other bacteria that are probably not going to grow on there but also if you want to select for yeast that are going to be able to attenuate beer you can also uh, pre alcoholize your beer to about three to five percent alcohol with something like vodka um, this makes it a little bit more stable it also makes it so that it's less likely for yeast to jump in there and grow uh, but the nice thing is you know that whatever yeast are in there are going to be a little bit more alcohol tolerant yeah it's sort of a another kind of culling step to um, all the microbes that might get in there so it's actually going to um, adding some alcohol to your media is actually going to make it easier to isolate strains uh, down the road for you fun facts with timothy did you know that Mercury and Venus are the only two planets in our solar system that don't have a moon? Now you do. Fun facts with Timothy. Um, so that is the basic practice of putting your media out there and then creating, making that media so it's selective. You want to lower your pH. Um, add a little hops and add a little alcohol. Um, and at that point, you should end up with basically some kind of Saccharomyces or Britannomyces strain um, that you can isolate. Yeah. Um, so the next step of that process is where things get a little bit, um, a little bit weird. So uh, at this point, a lot of people will actually send um, their samples that, um, that for one, smell and taste okay. Um, you know, use your senses at that point. Um, obviously, if it's got mold growing on it, if it smells like vomit, um, that's something that you definitely want to toss out. Yeah, um, but don't if put it, that in your body. Yeah, if it actually starts smelling like beer, um, typically it's going to smell kind of like a Belgian ale, um, then uh, you're definitely on the right track. And most people will actually send this into labs. Um, and what they will do is they will actually streak out um, some colonies that they find on there. Um, usually they'll send you back at least one, um, but usually multiple um, isolations of either yeast or bacteria. Um, and then you can actually take those uh, street plates and build those up uh, to kind of continue on with your testing process. If you're super adventurous, you can actually do this at home. Yeah. Uh, White Labs actually sells pre-made uh, growth media, uh, specifically selective growth media. Yep. And one is a sulfur cuprate um, selective media that actually specifically will select for Saccharomyces strains. Uh, and they can also give you specific ones that are perfect growth media uh, just for uh, yeast itself. And so if you have a little bit of, you know, bio lab chops if you got an inoculating loop and you know a streak plate you can easily just take a little dab of your culture and do a streak on your streak plate and that should help you isolate specific colonies that you can then go and try to grow on your own yeah i mean ultimately if you want to get uh sort of real redneck um, a uh, pressure cooker and a blowtorch is all you need. As sanitary as you can be. I mean, yeah. you got to realize if you're doing this at home, you're not going to have a complete, completely sterile lab environment. Uh, but it is still very possible and very likely even that you can get a quality isolated culture. Yeah, exactly. Nothing's perfect. Um, and like we said at the very beginning, uh, this is a game of numbers. Yes, you might get a slight bit of contamination, but there are multiple ways to basically get an isolated colony. And if you want to learn more about streak plating, let us know in the comments. We'll definitely try to answer some of those questions towards the Q&A section of this uh, when it comes to how to isolate specific strains or you know different isolating techniques. Um, but even if you don't do that, even if you know that you've done a selection that's good enough to get something that's going to grow, even though it's probably a mixed culture, you can also grow, uh, start growing that and through a couple of different uh, generations. Build up stages. Build, yeah, build up stages. Uh, they will start to select themselves out, especially if each generation has a pre acidification of under that 4.5 and is hopped. And as you're growing that yeast, it'll kind of select for yeast that are going to do the job a little bit better uh, while those yeasts start to outcompete other yeasts. Yeah. So the next steps once you get an isolated culture um, <clears throat> and you can get that selective media is to basically grow up some colonies on your media. These are going to be pretty small to start with. Um, but then you'll actually take those colonies, 
um, you'll inoculate a very small amount of wort with those. Um, typically, it's only going to be um, a couple hundred milliliters, maybe. Um, you're going to grow that up over the course of a few days. Um, and then once you grow that up, um, you now actually have um, a viable amount of yeast to uh, pitch into uh, basically your next wort starter. Yeah, so like a half gallon to a one gallon starter would be the next step. After you've grown it up for a couple generations, your half gallon to a one gallon starter doesn't necessarily need to be pre-acidified because you should have already selected that out through other processes, uh, but it, it should be strong enough basically to, as it inoculates the wort, to acidify the wort itself. Yeah. Um, and so that's not a necessary step, but if you want to be cautious, you can always continue to pre-acidify your starter. That does just slow the growth rate a little bit. Yeah, as a general <clears throat> rule of thumb, um, your yeasts in you know a nice healthy environment um, are going to divide and basically double double the amount of cells that you have available um, about two to three times a day. So um, while that might not seem like much, you, you have that uh you have that exponential factor involved with it. So of course, through all this, it's important to be using sanitary practices. Um, if you wanted to basically skip a couple steps, you could go from your macerated fruit starter. As long as that starter, again, was pre-acidified and hopped, you can go from that macerated fruit starter, uh, which as an example, if you were to crush up an apple, I think I said that before, uh, or even if you get fresh uh, pressed apple, for apple juice or apple cider. I know we have a couple orchards nearby that'll actually crush juice for people. If you let that sit out at room temperature until you see a little bit of starch to fermentation, you can actually add some of that uh, to a starter and kind of grow that up in just the same way. And that'll have the natural microbes that were on that apple juice kind of doing their own thing. Uh, and if you add a little bit of that to your selective media, pre-acidified, hopped, uh, then that'll start to select out while growing the yeast that you want as well. Yeah, so that is going to be the main technique for doing that. Yeah, um, and someone did say, how do you isolate from bacteria? We, we talked about that a little bit at the beginning, but the uh, hopping uh, and the pre-acidification were what we did. So most bacteria actually don't like hops, including beer bacteria. There are very few strains of lactobacillus, and most of those are, you know, because we've bred lactobacillus yeah. for so many years. There are very few, if any, wild strains of lactobacillus that can stand hopped wort even to four or five IBUs. Very, very unlikely as long as you have low pH. Um, you got uh, some alcohol in there and you have some hops in there that you're going to get bacterial contamination. So now that you've got your yeast, now that you've got some sort of culture, you know things are growing, uh, and then you've got the biomass that'll kind of precipitate to the bottom of your starters. Um, first of all, you can just use that if it's smelling and tasting good. Uh, in your next beer. Um, they say that the best, you know, safe practices is actually to let this ferment for 30 days before put it into new beer, just in case there's some bacteria in there. Um, the reason being uh, that alcohol, uh, Al alcohol stopgap, if there is anything else growing in there, will take about 30 days to kill off absolutely everything. Um, but if you pre-alcoholized or if you've done generally sanitary practices like the pre-acidification and the hopping, there shouldn't be a risk of any of those other bacteria in the first place. So that's yeah. probably not a necessary step. Uh, but let's say you got something that's smelling good, tasting good, and it's pitchable, and you want to kind of take a better look at what it is. Is it going to be Saccharomyces, which is most likely? Is it going to be Britannomyces, which is less likely? Uh, or is there any bacteria in there? Uh, you can also have the final step of of throwing it under a microscope and taking a look at it. Yeah, the Saccharomyces strains will generally be uh, relatively round or ovoid, and they won't uh, they won't form really big stringy colonies um, called hyphae, pseudo hyphae. Um, yeah, but otherwise, yeah. So there's some differences. You can look under a microscope. Uh, microscopes are actually really great just for seeing if you do have a true isolated culture. Uh, one thing to note too, um, not even using a microscope. Um, is that yeast will almost always uh, form a, a sort of clear culture. So, you know, we talked about streak plates earlier. Um, if you actually are looking at it um, on a streak plate, you'll see these little kind of round dots um, that are going to be your colonies. Um, and generally, if they are off-colored or if they are opaque, um, odds are those are not yeast. Um, they will usually be um, only slightly hazy, if not closer to clear. <laughs> 